Healing Peace portal. Welcome here, I invite you to stand if you're able and join with us as we sing songs and praise of our good God. Friends at home, we're so glad that you're here with us. We're so glad that God is everywhere we are. Let's praise Him together.
let me read to you some good promises that our God makes. Proverbs 15 says, God doesn't miss a thing. He's alert to good and evil alike. Psalm 121 says, the Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. In Isaiah 43, it says, don't be afraid. I've redeemed you. I've called your name. You're mine. When you're in over your head, I will be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God, the Holy of Israel, your Savior. And 2 Corinthians 1 says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of all mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I was on a flight this week and the seatbelt sign came on at a random time and the flight attendant's voice came on and he said, I know that you can't see what is up ahead, but our captain can. And I was like, okay, God, I hear you. I hear you, I hear you. So let me just remind us, we can't see what's up ahead, but our God can. We can look back in our life and see what God's done, but God is both here in our childhood that we had, in our future. God is in heaven. God is at home. God is everywhere and we can trust our God with all of our wonderings, with all the things that we're waiting on collectively and individually. We can trust in our God. So let's sing this song with faith that Holy Spirit is ready to come into this room, come into the screen, come into your home, I'm ready to move in your life and comfort you in any of your affliction. Let's sing this song together. We are waiting for your sure arrival. We believe you are on your way. How long until we see your face unveiled? Lord, give us faith in the way. We are waiting for your sure.
exists within the Trinity. That from the beginning of time, this eternal love that exists within the Trinity, you in your kindness have opened that and shared that with us and invited us into this love. 
And so we do, we praise you, God. We thank you for your kindness to make it possible that we might know you, be loved by you, and love you in return. And so we rest in that this morning, Father. We stand and rest in that. As your people, we have been brought into that. We are loved by you. Like the Apostle Paul says, we know you, but more importantly, we are known by you, and we rest in that, God. Thank you. We praise you, God, this morning. And in your kindness, you love us, you invite us into that, and you extend to us an invitation to join you in your work in the world. So in that place, God, as we rest and receive from you this morning, we ask, Holy Spirit, would you come now? Give us ears to hear this morning, your word preached, eyes to see you at work in this place, in our neighborhoods around us, and would you lead us out that like Paul prayed, you would open up doors for opportunities that we might testify to uh, the goodness of the gospel, your kindness shown towards us, the fact that we have been found by you more and more in this place, God, for our community. Would, you, would it be so that we have opportunities to testify to what you've done for us? So come, God, lead us into that. We do that with you, loved and known by you, God. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. You can have a seat. My name is John. I am one of the pastors here at Peace Portal. And just a few announcements before I invite Scott to come up and uh, share God's word with us this morning. Uh, the first is this, uh, as we've said the last few weeks, um, if you are here in the building, um, you can give, uh, when you come in, both in the downstairs and upstairs, there's places to do that. Uh, and then online, you can continue to give. We're really thankful for your continued faithfulness in giving over this last season. And so those are the ways you can give uh, going forward, if you're here, and then online if you're at home. Secondly, uh, next Sunday marks our second of two uh, park hangouts for the summer. So at Bakerview Park, at 1 o'clock, we're gathering a few times this summer just as a chance to uh, reconnect uh, if it's been a while for some of us, a uh, chance to play some games. We'll have spike ball and soccer and frisbee and a tent set up. And yeah, we just encourage you to bring some lawn chairs, your own food and drinks, and come hang out with us. Some of us from the church will be there on staff, and we'd love to see you and connect. Uh, invite your friends to that. That's a great opportunity to invite your friends. There is a park there, playground for kids. So yeah, next Sunday, that's August 8th, that one uh, will end around 2.30. And then lastly, Part of our summer rhythms, uh, we have been working through a book called God Walk by Mark Buchanan. Uh, so last month, uh, a group of us met to chat through the first half of that book. Uh, on August 11th, uh, we'll chat through the second half of that book. Now, if you missed the first, you can still join us for the second. Just make sure you've caught up your reading. Uh, but we'll be discussing the second half of the book. Uh, you need to register online for that so we can prepare for numbers and who's coming. Uh, but yeah, that's August 11th. Uh, if you don't have a copy of the book, we have extra copies, so just email um, myself, and we can make sure you get a book for the 11th. Uh, and that's all. At this time, I invite you to turn your attention to God's Word. Well, good morning, church. Great to be with you. My first chance to uh, open up God's Word this summer with you. Uh, great to have people in the room. And welcome to those of you online as well. What do we do with Mary, the mother of Jesus? To say, oh, she's just another person in God's great story seems to be a bit too much of an understatement. This was Mary who bore the God. She's pretty unique. She's got a pretty special and one-of-a-kind calling on her life. To say she's just another person seems to undersell things a little bit. But to say, well, she's extra special, to venerate her, to declare her as sinless, to pray to her as some of our brothers and sisters do in the Catholic Church, well, in our view, 
here at Peace Portal. That's taking things too far. That's taking things beyond Scripture. So what do we do with Mary, the mother of God? Today, I'm going to invite you to just appreciate and learn from her. As we continue on in this series, Hello, My Name Is. Uh, If you haven't joined us yet on uh, this summer series, it's a chance for various pastors of Peace Portal to speak on some of the Bible characters that have influenced their spiritual journey. Now, for me, this was a bit of a tough choice. I'll tell you right off the top. Uh, Mary or Jacob? Those were the two main Bible characters that I was wrestling through. And to be honest, it would have been easier to pick Jacob in part because we know so much more of his story told for us in the book of Genesis. We actually don't know that much about Mary. For such a significant person in the salvation story, we don't know that much about her life. We know she lived in the region of Galilee, and so uh, we know she lived up here, and we know that she was in a small little town called Nazareth right there, and we know that she was betrothed. This is the Christmas story, betrothed to Joseph. We know that Joseph and Mary had a family. We don't know that much about their family. We know that Joseph was noticeably absent in the rest of the Gospels, and so most scholars think that Joseph probably died before Jesus began his three years of public ministry at the age of 30. And so Mary was probably a a widow and a young widow at that. Um, When we're introduced to Mary in Luke chapter 1, which we're going to read in just a moment, she's probably around 15 years old. And then she's only mentioned in the Gospels uh, a handful of times. And we're going to look at most of those today. But let's start in the beginning. And this is where we're going to house our, my two primary thoughts for us today is from Luke chapter 1, a familiar Christmas text for a lot of us. Let's read it together. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, You are to call him Jesus, for he will be great and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age as she, who, sorry, as she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Let it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. I want to share with you today two things that I love about Mary. One, I love that she asks. And we'll dive into that in just a moment. Two, I love Mary's surrender. Now, most often when we are looking at this passage, uh, we focus most often on this second point, uh, her surrender, and rightfully so. Mary's response to this um, proclamation is the quintessential response of faith. It's beautiful. We're going to look at it in just a moment. But before Mary surrenders, she asks. Did you notice that in the passage? And and listen, I'm I'm so glad she asked because uh, it helps me. Maybe it's going going to help some of you to more easily relate to her because of her question. It's found in verse 34. Mary responds to Gabriel's announcement of her upcoming pregnancy, of the fact that this child is going to establish a kingdom that will never end. This is messianic language. This is something that the Jews had been waiting for. This is Israel's great hope. 
They've been waiting for hundreds of years for this. And now Gabriel is telling Mary, she is going to play a part in this story. And Mary comes back with, in verse 34, um, question, how is this possible? Because I'm a virgin. Gabriel, I know you're an angel and all, so let me tell you something a little bit about the birds and the bees. This kind of thing doesn't just happen. Before Mary moves to surrender, she asks a question. And I think that's good news to those of us who ourselves ask a lot of questions. Those of us who maybe sometimes struggle in faith. Those of us who wrestle with God and don't always feel like we're perhaps on the same page with him. Mary asks a question. And if you think I'm making too big of a deal of this one question that Mary asks, in this interaction, let's just quickly go through the gospel accounts when Mary shows up and asks other questions or have other comments to make. In Luke chapter 2, Mary makes two appearances. The first one is when Mary and Joseph take Jesus to uh, be dedicated. This is when Simeon and Anna, who Amy preached on just a few weeks back, this is when they recognize and they celebrate Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. A beautiful moment. Within that same chapter, Mary and Joseph take Jesus, who is now 12 years old, to Jerusalem to celebrate the Jewish Passover festival. And as they're heading from Jerusalem, they realize that they've forgot him. They left him in the city. So listen, I've, there's some young parents here. You know, if you've forgotten to pick your kids up at Kidshine or from school or sports program, don't worry about it. Even Mary and Joseph made that mistake. But it's actually worse for them. They didn't just forget him. They actually can't find him for three days. It'd be stressful as a parent, wouldn't it? And probably more so because of who you're parenting. Could you imagine wandering around Jerusalem for three days thinking, I can't believe I misplaced God. Like, how did this happen? I was given one job and now I've lost God. When they finally find him in the temple, Mary asks another question. Isn't it interesting? Mary asks a question of Jesus. But it's a question that's got a little bit of an edge to it. Almost a bit of a rebuke. Luke chapter 2, verse 48. Son, she says to him, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. And Jesus then answers with a little bit of frankness and perhaps a rebuke as well. Why were you searching for me? He asked. Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Mary and Jesus, not totally on the same page here bit of tension, some things maybe to work out between them. John chapter 2, Mary and now adult Jesus at a wedding and the wines run out. The groom and the bride's family are going to be shamed. And so Mary declares, my son will solve the problem. Maybe she's thinking that it's time for Jesus to step out and step into his public ministry. Maybe she's like pushing him out of the nest. Come on, it's time to roll, Jesus. We don't know exactly why. But there's clearly some sort of dynamic going on here. Mary putting up her hand and volunteering Jesus. Jesus responding with woman. Why are you involving me? My time has not come. In essence, mom. Mom. Quit trying to force things here. And yet he goes on to do the miracle. He changes water to wine. And it's his first sign in the Gospel of John. Some differences of opinion. Some things to work out between Mary and Jesus. Perhaps most uncomfortable for us, Mark chapter 3. As Jesus pours himself and devotes himself to his mission that God has given him, Mary, the concerned mother, is trying to slow Jesus down. She sounds perhaps like a good Italian mother. Son, you need to eat more. You're wasting away. 
In fact, Jesus is so focused on his mission that his family actually starts to get concerned for his mental health. Yes, this is true. Mark chapter 3. And Jesus actually responds with a pretty tough answer a little later on in that chapter. And he says, well, who is my family? Who is my mother? Who is my brothers and my sisters? It's those who do the will of God. Clearly not on the same page, Jesus and Mary in this instance. And while the Gospels don't declare it, it's pretty safe to assume that Mary in John chapter 19 was dealing with all sorts of confusions and disappointment and grief as she had to process her own lost expectations as she stood on Golgotha and she watched her son get tortured to death. The outworking of Mary and Jesus' relationship throughout the gospel is not some docile, passive, quiet, timid thing. I think we most often think of Mary like that because of this first interaction and this beautiful surrender that she declares in Luke chapter 1. But when we read through the Gospels, we see actually something different. We actually see a strong woman. We see a woman who is opinionated. We see a woman who is up front with Jesus. She didn't hold back with him. She shared her opinion. She asked her questions. She vigorously engaged with Jesus. And the outworking of her relationship with Jesus then wasn't always neat and easy. And for some of us here this morning, that might be encouraging news because you might describe your relationship with Jesus more like a wrestle than a follow. You might be listening today online and and you might be one of those people that look around at others that just seem to so easily have faith. And you think, how do they live like that? How do they just uh, are so content with just kind of the surface responses? How aren't they bugged by some of the mysteries of God or some of the complexities of our faith? Some of you who wrestle might think, oh, I'm such a bad Christian. Why can't I just find it easy to believe? Why can't I be one of those people that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. Oh, I'd love to be like that but I just can't be. Listen, if that's you, be encouraged today. Be encouraged by Mary, who likewise had to work out her faith together with Jesus. And hear me today. Those of us who wrestle with our doubts or wrestle with God and process things and long for things to be more clear than they are, Those doubts and those questions, they don't need to be suppressed or denied. They do not need to be even viewed as an enemy to our faith, but rather they could be viewed as the very things that will deepen our faith as we address them with Jesus. They can actually help our faith become more robust, a a strong faith that can actually withstand the challenges of our lives and the culture, the things that culture might throw our way. This is one of, I think, the the important shifts in the evangelical church that needs to take place if we are going to effectively disciple the next generation of people, kids, young adults, teenagers. I think at times the evangelical church has been guilty with just telling people what to believe. And if we just tell them enough, they'll quit having questions and that'll be a good thing and then they'll just follow. And as a result of that, we've viewed questions or doubt uh, as something to be afraid of, to some, something to suppress. And so as a result, within church, we have a whole bunch of people dealing with questions that they're afraid to ask because they're told, just believe. Believe. Don't ask that. That's out of bounds. And there's some great writing that's coming out that's helping us begin to shift our perspective on how we disciple the next generation because that approach is not working for the young generations. 
A.J. Swoboda has written a great book. If you're processing this yourself, or if you're processing this with one of your children or your grandchildren, this is a great book to help you learn on what it means to journey with a younger demographic that just won't accept being told something. They need a conversation. They need a safe place where they can ask all sorts of what might be scary questions for us to hear them ask it, but we need to create that kind of a space for people to work out their faith and let God deepen their faith through the wrestle that they must have with him. I love that Mary asks the question. And if I was to be completely transparent with you today, I'll tell you why I love it. Because on the one hand, I feel like I have this deep faith that is unshakable. It's this gift of the spirit in me that just trusts Jesus and I want to follow him with my life. And on the other hand, I struggle with faith. I wrestle with God. I wish some of the mysteries weren't there. I wish he was more clear on some things. I don't like it when things seem to collide or miss uh, the truths that we believe about God. I question and I wrestle and I struggle and I try to intellectually search out answers so that there can be some sort of congruency to an authenticity to my faith. And sometimes there's great answers and sometimes there's not. There's just mystery. And this wrestling that I and many of us do, this addressing the questions that we have. These are good and important things for us to do. But at the end of the day, our intellect, our limited human understanding can only take us so far in that process. Yes, we should do the work to understand and, and um, present our faith in a reasonable and articulate way and understand what God's word says to our particular situations. But at the end of the day, we are going to get to the place where we have to choose faith. And I love how Mary does that in this passage. Yes, she asks her question, how am I going to get pregnant? And Gabriel answers, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come on you. The power of God's going to overshadow you and you're going to conceive. And Mary says, okay, And this is what I love about Mary as well. Because if I'm Mary, I'm still asking a whole bunch of questions. I'm not getting to surrender quite yet. What do you mean the power of God is going to overshadow me? Gabriel, I need a little bit more information here. You're talking about something pretty significant. Overshadow, she wouldn't know what that means. She'd be very unfamiliar with the Holy Spirit, first off. And then who's that? And what's that going to be like? And then what does overshadow mean? The, the word only means clouds going in front of the sun and creating shade. So that's what's going to happen to you, Mary, and that's through the Holy Spirit, and you're going to get pregnant. What? Wait. More detail, please, Gabriel. And P.S., what am I going to tell Joseph? And what are, what are the villagers going to think? And how am I supposed to raise this child anyhow? Question after question after question would pour out of me if I was Mary. And she says, okay, you know what? God's word doesn't fail. Let his word not fail in my life. Here I am. I am the Lord's servant. It's this beautiful, full trust and this surrender. It's so beautiful. And in this, Mary, of course, follows this long line of uh, biblical characters who weren't outstanding in any way, shape, or form, except they had deep faith. They said yes to God without fully understanding everything, without fully being able to control the situation. They just said yes, and they trusted, and so they followed. And they let go. They surrendered their need to know it all or to control, control it all. They let God be God. So this is a really important counterbalancing truth to the first point. 
Because as I said, our intellectual inquiry, our desire to dig deep, our wanting uh, to understand things, our wrestling with God over certain situations or circumstances in our lives, all of those things are important and good, and we need to create space for those things, but they must be tempered with this humble recognition that we are not God. And we choose faith. And this is where, in my 25 years of walking with people and processing their stuff and their questions with God, this is where I think so many people start to get tripped up. They want an answer. They don't get it as clearly as they like. And they get frustrated. They get angry. They get bitter. They begin to drift. Eventually, they throw their faith out. That's what's happening in the younger generations right now. And it usually goes something like this, right? Something happens in someone's life, something bad, and they want to know why God let it happen. And often the answer that they may receive, if they get any, won't make sense or it's not acceptable. And in those moments, rather than humble surrender, they power up and they demand, God, I deserve an answer here for any number of reasons, their dedication or their sincerity or how long they followed or whatever it might be. God, you owe me an explanation. In fact, I'm not prepared to move forward with you, God, until I'm satisfied and I can approve your judgment on this matter. The problem is God doesn't owe us anything, including an explanation. And in fact, We've got a pretty good one in his word. In John chapter 16, verse 33. In this world, Jesus said, you're going to have trouble. This world is messy. It's broken. It's sin-filled. And you, my disciples, are not going to be sheltered from the chaos of a world gone bad. But take heart. I've overcome the world. And because I have, you will as well. And that answer as I speak it now seems fine for us until perhaps the heartache and the tragedy strikes us personally. And then we begin to wrestle. And hear me, the first part, my first point was that's okay. It's okay to wrestle and be authentic and bring our true selves to God. Bring your questions, bring your doubts, bring your disappointments and your longings to Jesus. But as you do that, recognize your human understanding can only take you so far. You will inevitably arrive at a point where you'll have to choose to walk by faith and let go. What I'm meaning to say this morning is this, that both of these characteristics, authentic wrestling with Jesus and surrender to him, Both of these two characteristics serve our faith journey well. Robust engagement with God, asking questions, working out our struggles, seeking theological understanding in things that builds a deep and strong real world faith. It's not shallow. It's not naive. It can't be easily broken. But conversely, humble this humble decision to surrender and trust the God of the universe keeps us from becoming arrogant and demanding and ultimately disillusioned by our human limitations because of our position in God's creation. Both characteristics serve us well as counterbalancing truths. And we actually see both in Mary and in her life. Mary, the one who asked, who wrestled, who shared her opinion, who was fully present and authentic with Jesus, and at the same time, the one who was humble, who trusted, who surrendered. And as a result, in spite of all the challenging or complex interactions that she had with Jesus, we saw a few of them just in uh, the few examples we looked at, in spite of standing on Golgotha and seeing the crucifixion of her son, 
The final picture that we have of Mary is a beautiful one in Acts chapter one. It's post-resurrection. She's waiting in Jerusalem with the rest of the disciples, just like Jesus had told them. So this beautiful submission again. And they're waiting for the promised gift of the spirit that would come at Pentecost. And there they are all together. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with them. I was struck by the thought today or this week as I was preparing that Mary had this initial encounter with the Holy Spirit that overshadowed her. And the result of that was a baby. And this baby then would be born. He would live. He would die. He would be resurrected back to life. And then he would pour out his spirit on all people. And isn't it amazing? Mary has this second encounter with the spirit in a totally new way as the God of the universe comes and makes his home in her. And not just in her now, but in all disciples that were there and in all of us who believe. It's this beautiful picture and this beautiful full circle experience for Mary, the mother of God. And we can receive and experience this gift of the Spirit. We've sung about it today. We've sung about who he is and his presence in our life. We can experience this because of the work of Jesus. On the cross, he took the consequences of our sin so that we could be forgiven and reconciled to God. And if you're listening this morning and, and you haven't engaged in a relationship with God, we'd invite you to do that by trusting him as your savior, inviting him to come and forgive you and to make his home in you through the grace of his spirit. Is this something you can do right now or it's uh, a conversation we'd love to have with you either after the service, if you're present here with us, or if you would connect with us throughout the week. But at this time, I want to invite the worship team up and we're going to conclude in worship. We're going to conclude by remembering the cross of Christ. We receive this gift of the spirit and forgiveness and reconciliation with God because of the cross of Jesus. And it's our habit to remember this each month as a church community together. And so we're going to begin by worshiping together and uh, in the midst of the song, we're going to participate in communion. And so hopefully as you came in, you picked up one of these uh, little communion cups and wafers. There's a top flap that will let you get into the top part of the wafer and then another flap to get into the juice. But just hold tight to those, onto those for one moment. At home, hopefully you can grab some, bre <clears throat> excuse me, some bread and some juice and uh, we're going to participate and take it together as a community in just a moment. But first, let's remain seated and let's center our hearts and our minds on our great Savior.
church in Corinth, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Church, let's partake together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's partake together. Thanks be to God. I want to invite you at this time to stand and remember not only Christ's death, but his resurrection and the freedom that he offers us because he rules over sin and death. Let's celebrate together. Thanks be to God this week. May you know the powerful presence of Christ with you through the grace of his spirit, one for us at the cross. 
Thanks for joining us online. Uh, we're going to sign off online. Uh, so God bless you, grace and peace to you. Those of us in the room, we're going to do one more song together before we head out and enjoy each other's company. So let's conclude our service together now with one last song. <laughs>